Chapter 18 Kingdom of the Jordan There are two main pictures painted of the Hashemite kingdom. Neither of them I found literally true, though both combine to give some flavour of the authentic atmosphere. Those who oppose kingship, the Hashemite family or Britain, claim that without the million-a-year British subsidy, Jordan would have no separate existence. Jordan, say some, has no right to exist at all, and never has been an independent state. Why should an arbitrary strip of territory, handed out as a sort of consolation prize for the loss of Mecca in 1921, peopled by rough Bedouins, be allowed to remain as a sort of subsidised British outpost? A number of British and other foreign romantics, most of whom have never been to Jordan, picture the place as a wonderful desert land, strewn with the monuments of ancient times and ruled by dashing sheikhs. Jordan is, in fact, a tourist's paradise, in that she has Petra, Old Jerusalem, Bedouin life, and the Roman remains in Amman. She has her back to the wall economically, because of the pitiful masses of Palestine Arab refugees who are camped on her side of the border. Lack of capital and machinery, and the problems of water and transport mean that her agriculture is not progressing rapidly enough to absorb the refugees or raise the living standards of her people. Equally, though, there is no doubt that the country has great potentialities, crops suitable to the climate, and some others made possible by irrigation, would create a very different picture of agricultural life given a few more years. For progress is definitely being made, and with uneastern energy at that. Like Saudi Arabia, modern Jordan first turned her attention to stopping the evil of contaminated village wells, piping the water from unpolluted wells and springs. Amman itself, once a cluster of mud houses nestling in the arms of a vast Roman amphitheatre, is as modern and progressive as any city in the Middle East. Jordanian experts are considering the possibilities of exploiting the riches of the Dead Sea. Everyone learns at school how one cannot sink in the saturated waters of this inland lake, yet few people seem to know that the mineral salts which the Dead Sea holds are among the most valuable deposits in the world of these substances, if they were extracted. While some processing was carried out on the Palestine side of the water during the British period, so far there is no commercial exploitation in Jordan itself. Unlike Iraq, Bahrain, Kuwait or neighbouring Saudi Arabia, Jordan has no tapped oil wells. But it is believed that the disaster which killed Sodom and Gomorrah, formerly cited here, was in fact a series of gigantic oil well explosions. Part of the government's programme is to rediscover the black gold. Then we'll show them, muttered a Jordan official to me, almost as one might say, through his tears. It is no fun thinking of the uncounted riches of one's neighbour, and knowing that you yourself might be rich, if only there were money to do the drilling and exploration. But most of all, Jordan is Abdullah, and Abdullah Jordan. Standing upon the steps of the new palace, gazing down at the Amman which was planned and built largely through the energy of that little king as he was affectionately known, I saw a small, white, unpretentious tent. Guarded by a single sentry of the legion, Inside lies Abdullah, buried in a simple grave. A pious Muslim of the Hanifite school, this descendant of the Prophet decreed for himself an austere resting place. From this height one sees the whole panorama of Amman's growth, its white stone villas, the bazaars centred around the twin minarets of the city's famous Friday mosque which Abdullah built. As I stood there in silent reverie, Gazing into the seven valleys, I felt almost as one seeing a vision of the mind, the hopes and fears of Abdullah the courtly. For is this not all the result of his own sweat and toil, since he entered Jordan at Marn on that fateful day in March 1921? 
Many a lesser man would have broken his heart here, would have preferred to live in a more comfortable exile, dreaming of the fair Hejaz ruled by his forebears. Instead, from barren rock and waterless waste, he moulded a new city, a progressive state, and in the passionate fashioning of it, he did not recoil sometimes from being a thorn in the side of East and West alike. Thirty years ago and more, when my father sat with his friend Abdullah in the palace, which is now the home of the Dowager Queen, they played chess, and the frightful difficulties ahead of the country were mentioned. Abdullah looked up, his eyes twinkling, with a serious undertone in his voice. Do not underestimate my people. Each one of these half-million Bedouins is a soldier, a farmer, a merchant, and a fashioner of a modern state brave words that would have appeared vain in almost any other man. Before the assassin's bullet struck him down in his own mosque a few years ago, Abdullah had lived to see his dream come true. Much has been said for and against Abdullah and his supposedly pro-British policies. However history may judge him, the fact remains that he, and he alone, was the architect of this tiny kingdom. In fact, it seems almost as if it is his memory alone which holds Jordan together. One influential sheikh told me, We have no nationality of our own, no history. Abdullah is what unites us, and it is his memory that tells us that we must go on, to the end of the road. And it is not so difficult, now that that great man has pointed the way. Nobody who knew him could but dedicate his life to the same path. Abdullah a dictator? He decreed his own abdication from absolute power in 1950, making the throne subject to the will of Parliament. Dictator he may have been, but he was not a tool of dictatorship. Parallel with other national preoccupations, the Jordan government is facing, and has been facing for years now, the living disaster of the half-million Christian and Muslim refugees from Palestine. Of these, only 60,000 were receiving organised help. But for the United Nations Relief Programme, which means in effect a million dollars a month, almost every one of these unfortunates would have perished. But who can live on 14 shillings per month anywhere? I had read the words of an American journalist who, after visiting Arab refugee camps, stated that the plight of the homeless was graver even than had been that of the Jews in Europe and I thought this a little exaggerated. After seeing with my own eyes the sufferings of these people, I think that he dealt too kindly with the situation. It is true that something is being done. Assistance, such as it is, is now uniformly distributed, but it is very thin butter on waferish bread. Sanitation, medical and social welfare services were working efficiently enough. The open-air schools and vocational training centres are impressive. As for the psychological effect of their experiences upon men, women and children, they are frankly in a most irreconcilable state of mind. The general feeling among refugees is that both Britain and America are responsible for the eviction of the Arabs from Palestine. The adolescent youths are growing up with only one thought, revenge. Food, somewhat naturally, monopolised most conversations. Nine and a half kilograms of flour per month did not provide even for the basic necessity of life. Officials at the camps reply that the refugees can supplement their incomes and buy rations by working outside. Since many are agricultural workers and there are no jobs for them, this idea seemed to me to be bereft of even superficial plausibility. The United Nations has failed dismally here, and its men on the spot know this only too well. Unfortunately, it seems, decisions do not lie with them. Numbers of refugees, it is admitted, are working on new roads and other development projects. As and when other schemes get underway, further refugee workers will be needed, if the starving wretches can live as long as that. Private charitable institutions like the Pontifical Mission, the Lutheran World Federation and the Muslim Red Crescent 
are pulling their weight in relief work, but the sum total of their work is almost unbelievably small compared to the immensity of the task. The general air of pessimism is shared by refugees and relief workers alike. Can the refugees be redistributed among the various Arab lands? It is estimated that Syria can take about 350,000, Iraq another 150,000, and Jordan could keep the rest. Part of the trouble is that not all refugees want to be resettled abroad. They seek payment for the orange groves or factories that they have lost. Virtually all, as already noted, want revenge and are hoping for a second round with Israel. Then there are those in the other Arab countries who say, our admitting these people will mean that we acknowledge that Israel has come to stay, had the right to dispossess them. The only condition under which they should be admitted is as temporary refugees, pending the reconquest of Palestine by the Arabs. I need hardly say that I never met an Arab who thought that there could, or should, be peace with Israel. But that was politics, which I never understood too well. To cool my head and fulfil a dream, I had to explore Amman, and then head for Rose Red Petra. <laughs>